uh, we've got a saying around here, and if nothing's on fire, we're going fishing. Uh, just meaning, you know, if if we don't have piles and piles of stuff to do, that's got a deadline and it's got to get out. If if there's a day where we think it's a beautiful day and we got to go, then we got to go. If you want to go fishing, I'm so caught up in doing this and getting these orders out and stuff that you don't get a break uh, sometimes when you may need one. So we try hard. Uh, if there's a good day out there, we're not that far from the river, you know, a little hour plus or whatever we can get to South Mountain or um, up in Asheville and stuff. So like we say, if it ain't, if it ain't on fire, we'll take the day. Another wildfly podcast. We are currently on episode number eight, and uh, kind of crazy that we've already made it to eight. It's been uh, it's been really fun doing this and getting to sit down with some really cool people and um, just have a fun conversation. Uh, today we've got our good friend Josh Brady on here, and uh, he's the owner of Brady's Handmade Nets. Him and his dad uh, run Brady's Handmade Nets down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And they make beautiful handcrafted uh, fishing nets, and so we're gonna we're gonna hear a little bit about their uh, about their story today, and just kind of how they have made it to where they are today. We've also got Adam on here. Adam's joining us today in the pod. But yeah, welcome, Josh, man. How you doing? Doing real well. Thanks for having me, man. Good to see Adam. Yeah, dude. Yeah, good to see you too, dude. Well, we uh, just first off, I really appreciate um, you know all the all the work that you've done for us so far and all the support you've given Wildfly, especially with the recent Short Bus Diaries series and producing those two nets super last minute and then driving and meeting me uh to get that. So we really, really do appreciate you and uh it's been it's been fun to see see everything grow for you. Well it's my pleasure and and uh, besides pitching in I'm a avid follower as well. So I uh I try not to miss an episode. Sweet man. Um well dude I would love to just kind of start from the top, just for people that maybe are unfamiliar with Brady's Handmade Nets and uh, what you guys do. Just kind of give a little rundown of who you are and uh, what you guys do. Uh, well, we cater specifically, or not specifically, but mainly to uh, fishermen, and uh, we create uh, handmade heirloom fishing nets. Uh, we like to think for the average Joe, because that's what we always were. We like to say, from hoop to handle, it's all yours. You create whatever you want you can change the lamination patterns and species of wood the handle material length shape and then, uh, add a hand burned or laser etched uh image to just make it your own we do everything from custom designs and logos like the lot and the wild fly uh we do phrases names whatever you can come up with uh we've either already done something similar and can do whatever it is you came up with it's, it's uh limitless as to whatever you can come up with and, and create in your own mind dude that's awesome you guys from what i understand kind of started this when you know you guys have a shed in your backyard you kind of started this <laughs> from a few nets that you guys had that that broke right or something along those lines <clears throat> yeah pretty close um what's happened was uh we had one of them old mesh nets that everybody's used to and uh, i took it out fishing one day and left it out there by the bank, and uh, it was actually my dad's net, so I decided that I was going to upgrade him to the new silicone, and, and back then it just, you know, started to switch to that material. Uh, very first day out on the river with this new net, we started walking down, you know, the path, got tangled up in some uh, root ball, and next thing you know, he goes crashing down on top of it and breaks it. And uh, oh, no. we had, you know, fabricators... Of, of our own and already had in the wood shop, we decided we we're gonna try and take it to the back and maybe use it as a as a pattern to make some new ones. And uh, we made the first one that just replaced his old net. We did that, you know, some fishing with that. He made one for me for Christmas. I made one for my son for Christmas. Uh, in fell a couple of orders in between there, and then uh, we posted those to Facebook, and it just kind of snowballed after that. We were doing you know, one net every four to six weeks, just kind of as a hobby for dad to, um, you know, keep himself busy down in the shop. And then, uh, I eventually ended up hurting my back at well at work. I was a welder for several years and, 
um, had already had a couple of back issues. And uh, while I was out you know, recovering, it was getting pretty close to the end of that recovery process. And me and my family decided that it would probably be better for us to take a different route. And um, like I said, dad was already doing the net. So we had already had a little bit of um, interest drawn up from, from Facebook. And uh, from there, you know, we, we decided we were going to do it. And, and we're kind of still on the fence a little bit, but we're, we're leaning hard towards doing it. <clears throat> the first day down there, we had a big order come in. And um, that was it. Once that order came in like that on the very first day, we were, we were pretty stoked and, and decided to go full bore after that. And I've been doing it um, three and a half, almost four years now. Nice. So did you guys have like a background then in woodworking before this, or was this always just kind of like a side hobby that you guys did? Uh, most of our, uh, actual background would be metal fabrication. I did welding and slight in some fabrication on industrial, uh, mezzanines and stuff. And dad did, uh, he did work for uh, NASCAR for several years and did crutch panels and, and some other sort of fabrication for them. So it was mainly metal, but we did have the hobby of the wood shop in the back and had done, um, like a jewelry box for my uh, grandmother and a couple of odds and ends for Christmas and stuff. And, um, the nets were just kind of, uh, a replacement. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, kind of starting out, you guys were just, you said, just kind of posting on Facebook and that's, that's where you got the majority of your clientele then. Uh, to this day, that's where the majority of our clientele comes from. We get a whole lot. Thanks to you guys off a of wildfly, I get plenty of people constantly telling me, uh, especially it seems to coincide with maybe when you're about to release a new video, uh, we get we're kind of an influx of either people talking to us or ordering, but, um, outside of that, the vast majority of it's all Facebook, Instagram as well. Dude, that's interesting. I remember you brought that up to me on the phone maybe a year or so ago, but you were like, yeah, whenever you are about to announce, you know, a new video or release a new video, even though it's not the video that we did a few years back, people, you know, I guess browse the YouTube site and they'll go back and watch that video and find find your nets and like through that way, which is pretty interesting. Uh, well, when I've noticed, I watch a lot of YouTube and what I've noticed it does the like recommended videos or whatever down at the bottom, uh, as you're looking through your subscription. So I'll come across a, a, your latest one. And then it's got, it almost always shows the, uh, Northern, Northern tales or Northern adventures. I can't remember that. The one that you did, uh, Northern natives, yeah. Northern natives. There you go. I almost always see that one. I don't know how many times I've watched it. That was the first trip with Adam and Steve, man. Oh, it's all, it's all been downhill from there. <laughs> yeah, it has been. <laughs> we definitely needed you on that trip. Our uh, our our nets were were not uh, were not very well equipped for those bull trout that that we were running into. <laughs> man, there was there was a huge fish, but it, it's uh that's kind of along the lines of what CJ catch up here. I don't think I've ever even seen one mm-hmm. swimming around in the water I've fished. Yeah, you'll you'll yeah. find you got to go pretty far north to, to find a man, but there's something special for sure. I know Adam likes him. Oh yeah, yeah. So Josh, um, you you were telling me you know I, that you had a, a time when you you know had an injury because you were a welder, and that kind of put you out for a little bit, and you really couldn't. You were very immobile. Um, was you know walk me through kind of what that was like, and then you know how that kind of turned into you wanting to to take this a little more seriously being home uh that was uh that was a pretty terrifying three or four months there uh it was the first time i've ever been hurt as an adult with uh you know financial support or anything like that from my parents i've got my own place and my own responsibilities that you know take my own funding and being out you know you've always got the, the whatever bills may come of, of uh, about with the injury um, and then on top of that, you know, your house and stuff, it, it was a pretty terrifying time having to go through that myself. Luckily, I, uh, pretty smart and put away quite a bit of money while I was welding. Um, I like to work the overtime when it's there and, and make that extra cash and then stock it away. So we had a nice nest egg to get us through. But, um, <clears throat> knowing that that had already happened a couple of times to me and, um, knowing the, the, activities, I guess, the, the workload that they put you under and constantly being in some sort of precarious on your toes position welding. Um, I knew that um, 
before we even talked about it as a family that that I wasn't going to go back to that. That was, you know, so laying there, I was, I was on the floor. Honestly, I couldn't lay in bed. Um, I had to lay on the floor and uh, laying there on the floor, just flipping through YouTube all the time. I was just kind of mulling over day after day what I was going to turn to. And um, I was still, you know, posting stuff to Facebook and I, we might have been on the Instagram at that point, but uh, was still trying to funnel you know, nets to dad while I was just hanging out. And, um, once I started to get better and I could get back on my feet and you know, I had a back brace and whatnot, but I could, you could get around and I could ride in the car again. Um, I just started coming down and hanging out with dad, just keep him company. Uh, I didn't do any work or anything, but then, you know, as that, you know, as I got better and, and time went on, um, I started to help out some more and, and really figure out what he was doing. And it's a pretty easy process, but those those Facebook ads started coming more because I was laying around. I was able to do it so much more. I wasn't busy at work and stuff like that. So it just kind of, it just kind of pushed us right into it. You know, once I was down there and, and I knew what was going on, and I knew we could revamp the shop, and and then the steam started to pick up on Facebook. It um, just kind of lended itself to us. Yeah. So you were well. Your dad was doing all the work. You were hanging out, doing all the the backbone work for uh, for the Facebook and marketing. It sounds like. Yeah, I still uh, I still handle all that stuff. Luckily, it's a little bit easier now that I've you know got it all on my phone instead of having to try and do it on the computer and stuff like that. But uh, that's that's a big. I usually call him a master craftsman. Mm -hmm. Every night, every net starts with him, and uh, it'll get to a certain point that he uh, passes it on to me, and then I finish it off. But uh, every net you get leaves a shop starts with him. That's, that's so sweet. That's yeah. I remember cool. when I got, when I got to go down and, and, uh, shoot that video with you guys and kind of see the shop and everything. It was, I was just so impressed with what you guys were able to do with such a limited space. And it sounds like you're still in that space, but what, tell me maybe what has changed since the last time I was down there <clears throat> with the company and with maybe your process or what you guys are doing out of that shop. Um, the process is still pretty much the same. We do have a couple of new machines. Uh, we've, you know, added a four foot by 12 foot or so extension to the shop since we've been there. Uh, we now have a dust collector cabinet with our air compressor in it. So uh, all that's housed out of the way and, and keeps the, the sound down for us in there while we're working. Some new machines we've gotten to help with the process uh, really bring the quality up a little bit. Uh, some of the older machines we were using would not leave the net flat. It didn't have a bow to it. Uh, well, this one is long, and, and, and we'll straighten that out for us. So up in the quality with the uh, machinery that we've got, and and um, as far as our the, where the business is heading, I mean, we're we're really trying to focus on uh, renovating some more of that space in the shop. Uh, we do have one wall that is is filled up with um, it's actually an old dresser that we use the drawers for certain things, but. Um, We've, we've got a couple of ideas to, to gut that side and, and really, uh, again, try and maximize that space that we have. Um, it leaves us with no overhead. You know, I think that's <clears throat> one of the things as, as uh, full-time net makers that you don't see a whole lot of is these guys not having overhead. You know, they've all have to have some sort of brick and mortar somewhere to, to build all this stuff unless they're trying to do it out of their garage and, I'm sure the wifey doesn't like that. So um, <laughs> we're trying to, you know, stay away from of, of trying to build a new place or rent one out uh, and, and just maximize what we got to, to keep that overhead to nothing. And we don't have to pass it on to our customers. Yeah. I mean, if you can stay in the shop, man, like that's, that's awesome. And it's, it's so yeah. convenient for you to just step outside your backyard and walk to work. <laughs> walk yeah. 20 Dad feet. doesn't have to go nowhere. He can, He's always there. You know, we've got a big backyard for the dog to run around. I don't know if you guys just noticed we got a new shop dog here recently. So uh, it, it really doesn't get any better than where we're at. You know, we just got to make sure that we maximize that space so that we can use it for as long as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me when, like, what started first for you guys? Was it like the fishing part or did you guys start doing woodworking? And I'd love to hear to how you guys got into the fishing. Um, I would say that woodworking for my dad started first. 
Uh, I wasn't doing much of it. I'd help him here and there when he was, he uh, did some cabinets in the, in his bathroom and a vanity. And I, I mentioned the jewelry box for my grandmother and stuff like that, but I'd just come and help him, you know, hold a long piece he needed to cut or whatever. So I just normally stuck to uh, work and he would fiddle around with the woodworking and uh, my woodworking really didn't come around until we started doing the nets. You know, I've, I've got the fabrication background. It's just transferring it to wood. And knowing that on a piece of metal, if you cut it apart and you can weld it back together, a piece of wood, it don't go back together once you cut it. So you got to, you know, measure twice and cut once. But um, right. the fishing was um, well before I started woodworking of any kind doing the nets. I uh, was, was working with a couple of guys that just mentioned they were going up to Green River to go camp for the weekend and mentioned trout fishing. And I know Dad had talked about trout fishing and he'd take me up to uh, South Mountain up in, uh, was it Burke County or whatever, Morganton area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was 12, I think, when he took me there. We spent a whole week fishing, chasing these trout all around the streams, and I think I caught one on the very last day. Uh, but in between 12 and 22-ish, I don't think I ever, never even seen a trout stream. Didn't even know they were around this area, to be honest. Uh, two guys asked me to go fishing with them or go camping with them that one week and ended up being on green river with some trout fishing. And that was it. I went from, from corn to power bait to spinners to fly rod. And here we are. Dude, there you go. A little different than you, Adam. Adam went straight to the fly, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, well, I guess I shouldn't say I went straight to the fly when I was like, when I was real young, but I started fly fishing when I was about eight. So, uh, I, I don't know if much fishing you did before you were eight <laughs> really counts. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's more chuck and duck. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little more like that. But yeah, no, I mean, I remember catching you know panfish and stuff on crickets, but uh, you know that was that that was a that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but de definitely really cool to see you know how how you you know, it, you guys were interested in you know woodworking and welding and making stuff and then you know, then this, you know, kind of the fishing came along and then all of a sudden now you have a, now you have a company based out of fishing, which is, uh, yeah. obviously really similar to what I've, what I've done and what Scotty's done too. So it's, it, I, I feel like that's a pretty general theme in this, in this community is that, you know, so you, you kind of find fly fishing and then you take your set of skills and then somehow adapt it <laughs> into, yeah, into the very fly much fishing so. world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree on that aspect you know you guys can probably attest to just like i can you find something like this that you enjoy doing you can apply your skill to that and make a business out of it i never work man <laughs> i'm always you know i'm always in a good mood talking to dad about stuff you know when we're going fishing again our new trips coming up the do south classics coming up there's you know what we'll can we there. do to peel out of here and, and and go fishing so i hear that yeah dude tell me I think it's so unique for you working with your dad and one, I don't know. It'd be tough for me to work with my dad every single day, but I think you, when we talked, when I was down there, you said fly fishing was one of the things that really brought you and your dad, you know, a lot closer to each other. And so how has it been getting to work with him on a day to day basis now? <clears throat> uh, you know, in the beginning it was, uh, there was some growing pains. Um, our work ethics are pretty similar, but um, whenever the, it was more of a communication, usually breakdown that um, he thought this one was more important than what I thought was more important. And, and our schedules didn't align as to what needed to go out uh, and when. And um, there were some clashes in the beginning, uh, but um, we've had several uh, table talks together and, and expressed where we were at and knew that, it wasn't something that either one of us was going to walk away from. You know, we really felt uh, from day one that there was a strong chance we were going to be able to turn this into something that, you know, compensated our income. And um, neither one of us was going to give up on it. So uh, we worked through those differences and, and understand where each other was coming from and have streamlined the process now to, like I said, everything starts with that. Uh, he cuts the handle, he reads the order, cuts the handle, makes it all from, from glue up to ready to be shaped. It's, it's very rough and, and squared off. Then I come in, I plane it down, clean it up, 
cut the edges, round them off, file it down, put the pitcher on it, and then he finishes it with the 10 coats of our uh, blend. So it's a, it's a divided process for us, but it's one that, that we over time have figured out this is what, this is the give and take we need, what works for us. And um, it allows us to you know, push through them, you know, get these nets out as fast as you can, but, but not sacrifice any quality and still work together in the shop and, and maintain that, that balance and that understanding so that we can, we can push through these and not constantly have to butt heads and, and fight with each other about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are getting busier as it sounds and the more I've talked to you. So how are you guys able to keep up with that quantity and also keep up with the quality? Like what is the kind of process look like for you guys in terms of length of getting, getting a net done? And then how are you, how are you able to kind of keep <clears throat> that quality up to par with what you want? Uh, well, the first thing we did was we quoted everybody three to four weeks before they get their net. First thing we did was push that back to six to eight weeks. Um, once the quality started to come around, or once the process really started to form itself, and uh, we we streamlined everything. So uh, the handles, any handle that you pick, unless it's some random numbered measurement, we have a pattern for it. Any shape hoop or size hoop that you ask for, we have a pattern for it. So there's no, there's not a, it elim eliminates all the measuring and cutting and, and that extra steps. Um, streamlining that process, you know, gets it to really flow for us and, and we understand um, how that will help us and, and, and keep everything moving for us. Once that was finished up and we really had that ironed out, then the orders kind of picked up some more and kept that length at six to eight when it should have probably expanded past six to eight weeks. But uh, like I said, it, it's kind of been a back and forth. You know, we, we had to extend the time and then build the, you know, efficient, make the process more efficient. And then the time and the efficiency kind of caught up with each other. And now it's just kind of stuck at six to eight weeks. No, that's great, man. Um, Cause I was curious, you know, obviously you, what you do is not an easy feat. Like it's, it takes a few day process from when I was there when you're showing me. So obviously you're not able to just turn over, you know, nets like the next day, like we've got hats here stocked and we can just ship them out, but it's, it's different yeah. for you guys, obviously. But do you guys sure. make any, make any of them beforehand? Cause I know you have a lot of offerings. Do you guys make any of the nets like pre-made that are already on the website? And so you can just ship out if someone orders that? We try to. But uh, for the most part, everything's uh, custom built. And, and uh, by the time I even get two or three of them unstocked and, and ready to go, somebody has called me and said, man, you got something right now that can be shipped? Well, and I'll tell them, you know, I got two or three, you know, where I've got. They'll pick one up. You know, it'll happen again by the time I can get another one back in stock. And I've had, uh, I think we made four in stock nets since the beginning of the year. And I don't, I've sold all of them already. I don't have any left. It just, uh, it's without working, you know, late nights and weekends, we find that I can't, I can't build up any sort of stock. Um, we just stick to the, uh, custom order end of it. Have you guys thought about expanding in like hiring someone else to, to kind of help with the workload and maybe pre-make some of those? Is that something in the, maybe the vision for the future? I have, um, I've wondered, you know, who I, who I might get for something like that, what I might source to, to, to find somebody that would be interested in, you know, sucking down all the sawdust all day. But um, we're hoping, you know, uh, with this these renovations that we're going to do here uh, in the coming months, that it's going to allow us to um, not handle the material so much that that's going to help streamline the process even more for us. Uh, and a couple of other things like uh, we really need to expand uh, how many uh, frames we have, hoops and handle patterns, and then building frames. Uh, we get so many of the same nut. It's, it's kind of strange how we won't build a particular style net for months and months, and then we'll get like seven of them all at the same time. And then we've only got, you know, one frame or two frames for that particular one. And that really backs up those, those particular nets. 
uh, Josh, one of my biggest questions that, that I guess I, I obviously I've got those uh, the short bus nets. I've been using them for some projects that may or may not be exactly in the short bus. <laughs> if, they're at my, if they're at my house, I don't know. Maybe they end up at my boat, and maybe they end up fishing with me. I don't. I don't know. I can't exactly explain how it happens, but. <laughs> one of, uh, you know, one of the things that I've gotten, I mean, people have come up to me at, you know, even like boat ramps been like, holy cow, that's a cool net or, you know, the people that I've been talking to or whatever. Um, and I mean, it, it, every quite a few people ask me like, man, aren't you like a little worried about using that net? <laughs> like, I, 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 I guess I get a lot of people ask me about how, uh, you know, kind of how strong, how, how durable these nets are. Um, I'm not sure if that's something you ever have to deal with. I mean, how do you ever have folks that are kind of worried about your nets or, or maybe like what kind of uh, warranty do your nets come with? Uh, is there anything you, you'd want, uh, you know, kind of some listeners to know about that? Oh, yeah, I get it all the time. Um, whether they buy it or not, I usually get some sort of comment, you know, 50% of the time. Well, it's that's too pretty to use. I'm, I'm not going to be able to I, – I can't see myself taking it out there or whatever. Um, my advice is – they're made to catch fish. Go use it. Um, we can. I wasn't so sure if we could in the beginning, but we can fix them most of the time if you break them. Uh, we just repaired a gentleman's hoop that he smashed. I mean, it was. It's a clean break. He smashed it good, um, and I believe that it's going to be uh, repaired. There, you can see some repair marks in it. We added some pieces to fix it and join it together, but. Um, I get it all the time, and that's my response. Go use them. That's what they're there for. We've spent a ton of time um, trying to reduce the weight on them by rounding and and making the handles very elliptical uh, so that they're comfortable, but the the, the mass of the handle in the center is as good and strong and sturdy. Uh, But go use them. We put 10 coats of of, uh, varnish that we created on them, wet sand in between, uh, so we use that varnish specifically because it's got uh, it's waterproof, it's UV protectant, and it also builds up ten layers, kind of like a armor sheathing. If you hit it, it usually dents the wood instead of chipping. Like if you were to use an oil or not even protect the wood. Um, so go use it, go abuse it. You know, if you need it repaired, we'll repair it. If you need it refurbished, sanded down, and and brought back to life, we can do that too. Sure. No, I, I've definitely, I've put mine to use, but I, I, I have always wondered like, well, what about obviously, you know, the hoop I've, I've broken a couple hoops on some nets. I'm not the most yep. uh, careful person on the planet. And, uh, yeah. uh you know, I've definitely, uh, I've always looked at that, you know, that short bus logo that you put on there. And I'm like, man, like I'm, I can't break this thing, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess yeah, it's good to know that to... even then you could just put a new hoop hoop on that handle and, and ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Huh? Yep. So far, we've uh, we haven't had a whole bunch of them. I think we've only maybe done three uh, repairs. But um, like I said, you can see some of the points that we've repaired it, obviously, because it was shattered. But um, it's it's going to work good as new. It's not going to cost you a brand new one. Uh, and if it was, you know, in any way sentimental to you, you got your net back. That's right. Uh, mm-hmm. The netting, you know, the netting is so easy to replace. Cut the string, pull it out, put a new netting in it. Um, repair it we can refinish it whatever you need done and uh, we do offer a two-year what i call manufacturer warranty if the hoop delaminates if water seeps into the handle and splits the handle or something like that other than your butt hitting it or shutting it in the car door if i can't repair it typically we'll replace it so um cool yeah i'd rather have somebody be happy and say look what these guys did for me than don't bother with them it's a wooden net because that's one of the main things that we do get is that it's wooden. How how sturdy, how rigid is it? Sure. Well, it's a wooden net. If if you shut it in a car door and you fall on it and you step on it, it'll break. Mm-hmm. Uh, you do have to have a little more care and, and, and concern over it than you would maybe say a carbon fiber fish pond or something like that. But go use it. Go abuse it. Try not to fall on it. And if you do, there's a good chance nowadays that we can fix it for you. That's awesome. That's, That's cool. good to hear. Dude, what'd you think when we we shot you over the the short bus diaries logo? <laughs> and to put uh, that honestly, on the I was really hoping that that's what the bus looked like. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> there's just something 
uh, something magical about the way that bus looks, regardless of you know the, the different <laughs> colored paint. It's the magic. Dude, school I was bus. I was beyond yeah I was beyond stoked when you sent me a picture of it. And I was like, that's the bus. That's I mean <laughs> it fits. You know it's it's uh it was awesome. Uh, <laughs> I was I was excited to do something like that because it really did stretch whatever I've done before on a fishing net. And um, then, like I said, I mean, I was I was stoked to see that that was the actual bus. That it just it it's got so much personality to it. Can't yep. beat it. It does. It's it's got its own smells <laughs> too, as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was Not... just watching uh, whenever you guys were first and got it, and that was something that Adam said. Is it had its it's got its own smell to it. Very distinct. <laughs> Very distinct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Dude, well, you're just you just mentioned something about you know like Fish Pond and some of those other companies. How have you guys kind of been able to compete with some of those bigger companies that are in like so many stores? When you guys are just you know still kind of a small company, um, running out of your backyard and everything. Well, in my opinion, we don't compete with Fish Pond. Uh, they make nets, but they don't make wooden heirloom custom nets. You can get, what is it, the Nomad pattern or something like that on them, which they're awesome looking. I wanted a fish pond before we started doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I don't cater to just somebody that sees it as a tool. You know, if you're if you're the type that is just looking for something to beat up on, then it's not for you. I don't I don't I don't cater to just the net. Look, the, somebody looking for a net if um if you're looking for a wooden net, something heirloom, something that's going to, what I say is accentuate the fish that you're fishing for. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of species it is. Um, that's the guy that I go after. So I don't really compete with them. I compete with other handmade net makers that I know of. Uh, I've done a lot of research in the last four years to find out uh, just who those guys are and how successful they are and, you know, try and pair myself with them and feed off of them and, and what they're doing and um, try and distinguish ourselves by uh, our finish is one thing that I really pride ourselves on. Uh, that glassy showroom, you know, brand new car off the showroom floor finish like they see yourself in. And then our artwork. Uh, we don't, uh, we do offer um you know, the curls and burls and the beautiful, expensive uh, burl handles. Uh, but what we prefer is just the planer figured so, we, you know, average Joe can afford it. But then our customization is the artwork and the names and the measuring numbers and whatever you can come up with. Uh, so those things are what I really focus on is is uh, the other net manufacturers or net, ma- net makers uh, and what they're doing and, and how I them versus someone like fish pond or broden or um what was one of the other i can't even the william joseph rising or, or yeah rising there you go see i can't compete with somebody who can put beer or, or liquor in their handle right <laughs> you might win I adam over if you I can figure that it. out though yeah <laughs> you know i i can't compete with that you know i can send you a flask or something to go with it or whatever but we're okay with you that know, 20 <laughs> couple of couple bucks off a beer coupon but that's about it so you know i we try and stay in our lane with other guys that are doing similar things and and i look into a lot of those guys you know i follow each and every one that has uh, had some sort of success and uh i use their nets and their creations as inspiration to do things for my clients so i, I that's that's our road and that's what we we travel down with. Dude, I love that because I think it's kind of the same in really this should be the same in fly fishing, but especially for me in videography, you know, there's all these other creatives out there and we're all kind of doing our own creative work. And, you know, we don't really I don't really look at them as like competitors, so to say, but more so like this community of uh, creatives and, you know, fly fishermen. And I think it's the same with you. You probably have this community that you guys are all supporting each other. You're all doing your Very own separate so. thing, but it's you guys are still. Maybe it's not so much you're looking at each other as competition. Very much so. We've all right, guys. We're back. We've <laughs> we've been having some real technical difficulties trying to get this this whole recording done. But just bear with us. This is uh, this is only the second time we've done one virtually. 
but uh, Adam had to roll. He had he had something he had to do, but we still we still got Josh here, and um, I I can't remember exactly what we were talking about. But one of the things that I think is so unique about your company is the relationships that you're able to make with your your clients and your customers. And for me, for example, that's what it really attracted me to you guys when, you, when we first connected or you first reached out. Um, I just really appreciated how genuine you guys were and how real you guys were. And you were able to work with me to, to put together something that would work for, for, for us. Um, but, you know, obviously I think that's one of the priorities for you guys because one of the things that you always talk about is you'll go and you'll drive and deliver a net to somebody if, if you can, or if they're close, yeah. um, talk about the importance of your customers and how you've been able to maintain a good relationship with each of them. Customers are my boss, man. I, uh, I, I love being able to go and interact with one of them, especially if I can deliver a net to them. Uh, the pictures that we were getting um, for Christmas and, and whatnot, those were just, um, they're icing on the cake. To see somebody know that I'm directly responsible for the smile on their face, I mean, that's that's A1 right there. Um, it, it, it just keeps you involved, keeps you in the community. The more you're in the community, the more you know people, the more opportunities you got to go with different people, go fishing, you know, the more different cultures that are mixed in there that you can meet. And it's just the same as this new South Classic we're coming up with. Uh, you meet so many different people at one of those that all have something to do with fly fishing one way or another, or they just, you know, enjoy doing it. But it, it's, it's an awesome way for me to connect with somebody that um, appreciates the same things I do. Yeah, there's no better way to do it, man. Like you were saying earlier, how work <clears throat> it doesn't it doesn't feel like work, you know? No. And especially with the people in this industry and the people you meet who are interested in fly fishing, um, you know, you you have this thing that you can connect with them on. That yeah. it's just you might not know at all who they are, what they're about, but you you've got this one thing which is so unique. And then you bring in something like yours, like a craft, and people really appreciate that. Even if it, it, some people are like, "Oh, that's you know maybe too expensive for me." I think people really do appreciate that that work that you guys you guys put into um, into the craft. So I was curious because we were talking about how you guys have become busier and everything, but how have you been able to continue to innovate and improve your craft of it? Um, of like the net making, even though you've been so busy. What's his name? Um, Bobby said, if you're not first, you're last, right? Um, what's his name? <laughs> Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Ricky Bobby. There you go. He said, if you're not first, you're last. And I, I really kind of live by something like that where uh, I do a hundred percent use these other guys that are in our little uh, net making community as inspiration, as motivation. You know, if I see this guy's putting out a picture, you know, 10, 12 nets, these are all going to somebody's house. You know, it's a big order, or even if those are all going to individual places, it motivates me to get back in the shop. and Man, I got to get this crap out. I, I got to do more, but whatever it is, and, and uh, seeing their pictures, like I said earlier, seeing how nice their pictures has motivated me to figure out some way in the back room here or somewhere that I could do better photos. Um, seeing those nice photos and seeing the work, the, the joinery and stuff on those it most motivates me to do, you know, whatever I can in that area to make those glue joints go away. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's self driven, but it's also motivated by, you know, my, like we said, it's not really competition, but I see it as that, you know, I, I don't, I don't treat them that way, but, um, I use those guys as motivation to, to do better. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, it's good to have someone you're, you know, competing with in a way to kind of keep you yeah. on, on your heels and, and keep you improving and never get like too comfortable. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. What's been the biggest challenge for you guys through this whole thing? The biggest challenge is making sure that the customer is getting what they ordered. Uh, we talk to, because of the time frame so long for the order, we talk to those customers sometimes several times in between even just the start of the build. So they sometimes will change. I want this picture and I want that shape net, this, this material. Can I change that? Can I change this? And then sometimes even just the shipping address changes. Um, so 
being able to stay on top of what they ordered specifically and sometimes those changes that come along with the duration you know of the build uh, that's been the biggest the biggest thing uh, i can build nets you know as fast as i can and i and, and we've gotten to that point now where we're pretty comfortably cruising at a, at a steady clip but um, the one that I stress about the most is making sure that I don't get that phone call or email saying, hey, man, I asked for this, and that's not what I got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, you're working with individual clients, and that it's very important yeah. to make sure to make sure they're happy. Yeah. Client, clients' happiness is always number one, for sure. Yeah, and, they're, you know, they, they everybody pays up front just because uh, we've had some issues where I've built nets with names and, and personal logos. Uh, on those and then I'm stuck with a net that has Jimmy on it, you know mm -hmm. um, So we do ask for our payment up front and some of these nets, you know Depending upon what you get or you know the epoxy nets will run somebody four or five hundred dollars Depending on how many images you may get to it or you know the size of the net or whatever <clears throat> So you've got a lot of change floating around out there for several weeks With nothing for me to show you, you know, it'll be a six to eight week time frame, but we won't start even thinking about your net until about five weeks. So right. there's a month and a month and some change there that you don't, I don't have a picture to send you. I can't show you your handle or, you know, there's no proof that I'm even working on your stuff and I got all your money. So uh, I do know that there's a, there's a lot of, on the line on that relationship there for me to uh, continue to communicate with them and let them not feel a sense of uh, being had and then providing what I told them that I was going to give them. Yeah, no, absolutely. What, you know, the, the flag that I see behind there is, and the nets up there, that's been, um, something I've seen at the shows that you guys go to. And I, yeah. I know from what we've talked about in the past, the shows are really big for you guys and you get a lot of your orders from the shows, but obviously with COVID this year, canceling a bunch of the shows, how were you guys able to adapt and kind of make up for that that void? Uh, we spent that money on marketing and, and mess, uh, <clears throat> marketing in, in other areas. Um, you know, with the Facebook sponsoring ads and stuff like that, with Instagram as well. Um, we shy away from you know we put some towards uh, Wildfly. I shy away from like radio ads and magazines and stuff like that. If it's not if it's not technological, it don't make sense anymore. Um, so we just, you know, shuffled that money around and that time around to different areas and, and, um, you know, Facebook and Instagram are a wonderful tool, you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll get so much done for you while you're sleeping and, and I'll wake up sometimes to orders or I'll wake up to messages and a list of people on the website. So we just allocated that, that funding and that time elsewhere. Yeah. How has, I'm curious from your end, working with us on some of the YouTube stuff, because YouTube is so new in the fly fishing world. And yeah. obviously people have used YouTube in a lot of other industries. It's like the biggest thing there is right now, but how has it helped uh, or has it helped your business working with us on YouTube? <clears throat> it's helped a lot. Like I, uh, like I mentioned, hey. <laughs> uh, joining us. yeah, it wants us 15 minutes. Um, yeah. It's helped a lot. I mean, I told you, uh, you always, whenever you're flipping through YouTube, you always have the recommended videos that are from that particular artist that you subscribe to. So a lot of times that's what I get. You'll get a, a video just this past Friday. You think you uploaded one. Um, that backcountry weekend I just met. I don't remember if I've had any orders yet from it, but I've had plenty of people message me from it. And that they, I think that's just from our video popping up in those recommended videos. So um, I get multiple a month, uh, four or five a month probably that tell me they're from Wildfly. Um, so YouTube in general, I think, at least for me, I don't usually watch anything other than uh, the occasional sports thing on Hulu or Netflix or whatever, but I check every day you know, YouTube for my guys that I subscribe to to see what else they put out there. So um, like I said, if you're, if you're not technological, especially YouTube, you better get on the bandwagon because that's, I mean, that's, that's TV now. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's where the eyes are. And props yeah. to you guys for, for being early on the train. Cause it, I mean, that video that we did was almost two years old now and you're still seeing yeah, two years in August. Yep. 
So yep. it, it's, and- good, it's, good, it's good for my end too. I'm like very happy that, you know, you guys supporting us and us putting this work into a video is also giving back a lot to you guys. Yeah. And you know, uh, both of us have to receive something. So if you're, if, if I'm not getting anything on my end, it doesn't make sense for me to keep helping you, even though I enjoy watching the video. So, you know, it, it you're, you helping me helps me help you. So I guess we scratch each other's back as it continues to go. Um, there's one, I, I follow a YouTuber and I've been following him since 2018. He's, uh, he's from, uh, Jupiter, Florida. And, uh, I've been trying to contact, contact him. Um, I've seen him all over the world, all over Florida, deep sea fishing, boar hunting, bear hunting, deal here, deer, you know, mule deer, everything that I can think of and every species of fish fishing, uh, even up to Wisconsin doing some steelheading on the, in, um, uh, where else was he? I, uh, Idaho on Snake River. Um, doing some awesome uh, fishing up north. Never seen him in western North Carolina mountains. You know, fly fishing for uh, some native rookies. Uh, I've been hoping that I can get in contact with him, send him a couple of messages. But I'd love to do something with him, with him too, just because, like you say, if you're not on YouTube, you're not getting seen anymore. Um, and so you can really feel the personality of, of, of you guys, uh, at least the ones that I subscribe to. And, you know, that's that's something that I really uh, pay attention to is I don't watch. So you can I can watch a bunch of different fly fishing videos. Uh, same with his deep sea fishing videos. But but I watch you and I watch him because of the character and the personality and, and the way you guys are and who you are that bleeds through your videos um, that that's made it super cool to be a part of it, you know, especially that, mm-hmm. you know, our, our relationship continues to evolve as, as time has gone on. Yeah, man. No, that's great. It's great to hear your perspective on that too, because like, obviously I'm producing the videos and I just like put them out into the world and like post them yeah. and then they're live. And like, you know, there's comments, like people will comment and stuff, but it's not like real people that I get to like interact with, you know, it's just right. like, Oh, there's this many views. That's this many people, but it's hard to fathom that. Like if it was, if I was like in a, a band or something, if I was in a band and you show up to the show and there's a thousand people there, you're like, Oh my gosh, like these are a thousand people yeah. that, you know, you don't quite get that on YouTube, but you still get that community feel. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think it is so important. Um, but yeah, dude, I'm excited. We're, we're definitely gonna have to to work on some stuff here and here in the future. Sounds good to me. I know we <clears throat> briefly touched on the fly fishing, but how are you guys able to, you know, balance going out and fishing? And <laughs> Harper's getting in here, the dog. Uh, but how are you guys able to balance the work that you're doing with, you know, fishing that you also love to do? Uh, we've got a saying around here and if nothing's on fire, we're going fishing. Um, just meaning, you know, if, if we don't have piles and piles of stuff to do, that's got a deadline and it's got to get out. If, if there's a day where we think it's a beautiful day and we got to go, then we got to go. It's just, <laughs> you know, you, you, you've got to, I get a lot of, I've heard a lot of people say, if you love fly fishing, don't be a guide because you end up spending all your time helping other people and guiding and stuff. And it's similar to this, you know, um, if you want to go fishing, I'm so caught up in doing this and getting these orders out and stuff that you don't get a break, uh, sometimes when you may need one. So we try hard. Uh, if there's a good day out there, um, we're not that far from the river, you know, a little hour plus or whatever we can get to South mountain or, um, up in Asheville and stuff. So, um, like we say, if it ain't, if it ain't on fire, we'll take the day. Dude, I like that. I think I think we all need a little more of that in our lives. I know for, for sure. <laughs> for me, I need that definitely. But so working as as your own boss um, for the last couple of years, what would you say has been the biggest lesson that you've kind of taken away from that? The biggest thing for me has been to just uh, not overwork myself. Um, I do have, you know, two boys that uh, are growing, you know, like weeds and um, 
my girlfriend, she works weekends every once in a while. So I try and fit the, the extra time in, in that time. But the, the, cause the biggest thing is to, to not get burned out. You know, you, there's, you know, doing these orders, these custom orders, you never get caught up. You're always behind. And in, in, uh, you may not actually be behind on the time frame, but there's always, you know, if, if we're doing it right, there's going to be a stack of orders there for us to continue to work on. So you're always behind. There's always something to do. There's always more that you could be getting done and more time you could be spending in the shop and, and things that you can renovate and change. And so it, the biggest thing for me is to make sure that we do fit in that time, whether it's with my kids or with my girlfriend or with my parents or on the lake or on the river, uh, making sure that. Uh, you don't get so overwhelmed and so wrapped up in this that um, you burn yourself out and you don't want to do it anymore. Cause then it does become work and it becomes labor. And, and when it's all on you and the money's already in the bank, I owe you, you know, I got to do it. So um, that, that's the biggest thing is making sure that you keep that work life balance. Uh, so everything's got the good ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate to have, fly fishing as an outlet, which is just, yeah, you know, one of the best things that you can be doing and one of the best ways to get outside, which, yeah. which is, you and, know, as you know, and I tell dad all the time, we're lucky that we don't have a river like you do that close, man. I'm telling you, if we we're in Boone, I'd be in a lot more trouble. <laughs> you know, it's an hour and a half and, and this one's the Packlet river. It's always muddy. I'd probably go down there and catch a small or something, but if I had one that was in the backyard, if it was a nice day, I'm out of here. <laughs> Nothing would ever get done. <laughs> no, it would be a couple of months before you know people would start wanting to know where their stuff was. Then we have to push that six, eight weeks back to six or eight months. Right, right. Um, well, that's great, man. I, I guess we'll kind of wrap up here in a sec, but what's maybe for people listening, what's one thing that, maybe a, a common misconception about your nets that you would, would maybe like to debunk? Um, I just like to reiterate the wood aspect of the nets. They are wooden, so they will break. You can't take them to a tree like a baseball bat. You can't step on them. You can't fall on them. I mean, sometimes you can and you get away with one, but for the most part, if you do something like that, it will break. Uh, the second one that I, I get asked a lot, they float. It's wooden. Wood floats. They they do fly. I get asked so many times, do your nets float? Yeah, they float. Nice. And then what do you think it was your biggest mistake when you guys or you first started out doing all of this? Uh, our biggest mistake was we went all in on one size net. Our first show we had 14 nets at that show. All 14 were the same size. Uh, and they were the Brookie nets that we carry that are smallest nets. That's 13 by 8 inch nets, 21 inches overall. It's a small net. Uh, anything around, we landed a 19 inch brown out of the Green River in that net. And it was everything I could do to keep that fish in there. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, tail and everything spilling out. Um, so our, our biggest biggest thing we started out in the beginning you know one of them flaws we had was that we thought this was going to be the one you know everybody's going to want this size net for some reason and then you start realizing you start you know talking to people and this spreads out and they ask can you make that size net can you make this size net can you do this one right there can you know and then eventually it went from a 13 by 8 to a to a 28 by 30 you know it's you know three and four times you can fit a couple of those nets inside that size hoop. Um, so our, our first one was we spent a lot of time, a lot of money in that um, that one particular size. And it took us probably two years to sell off all of those because, you know, we don't sell a whole lot of those small nets. You know, we our, our average size is our wade net. Um, but, it's, you know, it's multi-purpose. You can catch bass on it, crappy. You can go catch big tailwater fish, and, and it's even got small holes. So, uh, it's, you know, a little overkill, but you can take it up and catch the native brookies in it and they won't squeeze out. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, cool, man. And then I would just say the last thing I want to ask you was what is kind of the long-term vision for Brady's handmade nets? Like what, if you were to look into the future, what's something that, what do you want this to kind of turn into 
And what are your maybe your big aspirations for Brady's Hemi Nets? Well, I always thought if I can make my salary that I was making as a welder, then that'd be pretty good. Uh, and that including would have to cover dad as well. Um, so if we both can take a paycheck home and we're working hard on that right now, um, that's, you know, financially the future. I'd love to have at some point a new building, uh, where everything's un under one roof because we do, uh, the lasering and all the computer work and, and Facebook and stuff up in the back bedroom. And then we do all the finished work in the garage and all the, uh, handwork down in the shop. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, call me if you need me conversations with me and dad. And, uh, all that stuff could eventually be centralized in one area um, where we can have, you know, proper heating, proper air conditioning. You know, it was pretty toasty in there last time you were here. Uh, we didn't have upgraded that since, but um, heating's a whole different animal. You know, you don't want to you know burn the building down plus all that sawdust. You know, it could cause issues. So um, long-term goal, new shop. Uh, here in the future, um, I'd really rather have somebody do the Facebook side of it. The, the um, what do they call it? Um, I'm bad with words on spot, but uh, you know all that. Uh, the marketing the back, side, maybe. Yeah, the background noise that I don't like. I'm a builder. You know, you've seen yeah. our our setups at the uh, at the shows. They're all wood. We built all that stuff, you know, out of pallets and, and hinges lying around. So that's what I do. That's what I love doing. That's the same with dad. That's what he loves doing is, is working with our hands and, and, and building stuff to put smiles on people's faces. Somebody can also do the, they can do the technological side. Mm -hmm. I think that's the constant like battle that you're trying to fight as an entrepreneur or running your own business is yeah. finding, especially when you have some sort of um, artistic, backbone to the company and and if that's kind of like what you're doing like the nets you know you want to spend the most of your time doing that yeah and figuring out how you can outsource the other work that maybe is like you said just background noise um yeah and it's yeah. And it's definitely something that i don't know much about you know uh imagine if i actually had somebody to do something with that video that you created back in august or two years ago it would probably be working a lot harder for me but i don't know how to do it so um and even with the content, now, content, you know, it's difficult to to come up with. I don't know how to set up, show the same image, building the same net over again and still make it interesting the next day. So um, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff where people can give me a hand, you know, running the financial side, keeping track of books, doing stuff with uh, Facebook and Instagram. And they know what 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 works and, and how to get people's attention or at least find the people that are looking versus I just throw money at it and hope it works. Right. Yep. Kind of understanding why it's working and the strategy behind yeah. it. Yeah. I don't know why the boost works, but it does. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, but like you said, it's taken away from that takes time trying of to learn course. that takes yep. time away from your craft, which is the yep. main thing that's the driving the business. I really hope if you guys who are listening, if you haven't already checked out Brady's Handmade Nets, I hope you guys would go go give them a look. And if you're interested in in getting a net from them or curious about you know what they could maybe do for you, um, where where should where should people reach out? What would be the best way for people to reach out to you guys if they're interested in a net? Uh, the best way would be to email me at Brady's Handmade Nets at gmail dot com. But you can find me at Facebook. At Brady's Handmade Nuts, you can find me at Instagram at Brady's Handmade Nuts, or you can look up on our website. Give me a direct call or text message as well. I'm not gonna put my number out there on this, but um, yeah, no. We'll, anyway, we'll put, we'll put something know, in the video for you. <laughs> we're we're three sixty five twenty four seven. If I don't answer you, I will in a couple hours. You know, reach me anyway. It's easiest for you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Well, we. I really appreciate having you on and really appreciate everything you're doing for the fly fishing community around here in the Southeast and um, really bringing home the, the craft that you guys have and bringing that back into the spotlight. I think that's really important. Um, but yeah, we'll appreciate everyone listening. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, make sure you give this video a like and uh, yeah, swipe up <laughs> and go check out, <laughs> go check out Josh and uh, his dad's company. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it for us here, and we'll see you guys in the next one.